All right, this morning, as I've said, we're continuing in Luke's gospel, so I want to read the text, which is Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 17 through verse 26. And again, this is um, at least a version of the Beatitudes uh, with, with a bit of introduction here. So this is what we read beginning in verse 17. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place. And there was a large crowd of his disciples and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured. And all the people were trying to touch him for power was coming from him and healing them all. And turning his gaze toward his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding uh, this morning and to our edification. Now remember last week we saw how our Lord Jesus Christ lifted the Sabbath back to where the Lord intended it to be as Jesus also did in the Sermon on the Mount, which I, I don't think we see a lot of that in this particular sermon in Luke, but in the Sermon on the Mount, we see him correcting the false teaching of the religious leaders of that day. You have heard it said, but I say to you, well, we saw the Lord Jesus Christ do that um, with the Sabbath. Remember, God originally uh, uh, ordained the Sabbath, made the Sabbath uh, for man, for our good. God worked six days in the work of creation. And he rested from all that work on the seventh day, not because he was tired, but because he wanted to establish a pattern of work and rest for us. And then he blessed that day. He blessed it because on that day he rested. He blessed it because he wanted a day for our good. He basically gave us a day off. And he gave us the day off because we needed that day to set aside all the things that get in our way uh, of, of doing what it is we want to do the most as Christians which is to spend time with the Lord and to spend time with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, remember the Pharisees had turned that day from a day of blessing into a day of suffering. They wouldn't allow the Jews either to take care of their own needs or even the needs of, of others. When they accused the disciples of breaking the Sabbath by picking uh, the, the heads of grain and eating them to take care of their needs, Jesus defended them. That the Sabbath was made for man, not to make him suffer, but that he might be able to take care of himself on this day. And when Jesus saw the man on the Sabbath whose life was very difficult because he had the withered hand, Jesus mercifully healed him. Again, the religious leaders accused Jesus of working on the Sabbath, but he said, hey, if you had a, a mule or a donkey that fell into a ditch on that day, wouldn't you in mercy lift that donkey out of the ditch? Well, how much more? Should you do this for a man? We can show mercy to others. And then Jesus reminded us of something that we need to bear in mind. Just as he has the right over basically the creation, essentially over all things, he has all authority. And we've seen Luke building that case for Jesus' authority in many different ways. He has the right to tell us what may or may not be done on the Sabbath day because he is God. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He has authority over the Sabbath. Only God does because he is the one who established that Jesus is essentially declaring himself to be God. Now, last week we also saw Jesus choose the 12 from among 
all the disciples and how he saved 11 of these 12 that they might carry on the work that Jesus had for them to do after his time on earth was over. But we also saw how he passed over one in his mercy. And as he didn't show mercy to Judas Iscariot, this is the one who would betray him. This is the one who essentially was chosen for this particular purpose. And this reminded us that Jesus has the authority to give life. Jesus has the authority to withhold life. Even as he prayed to his father in his high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 2, Jesus says, You gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Jesus gives life, and Jesus withholds life as he wills. This is the sovereignty of our Lord, and this is his authority. Well, now we see Jesus come down from the mountain, and this is the mountain on which he had prayed throughout the entire night for the wisdom that he needed from his Father in order to single out the 12 from among all the disciples who were following him. And as he descended, he found a level place, either on the side of the mountain or perhaps all the way down to ground level. Again, is this the Sermon on the Mount? If this is the Sermon on the Mount, remember Jesus was essentially on a mount. So if this is the same sermon, then he only came down partway but found a level place to stop if he came all the way down, this is a, another sermon. It, it doesn't really matter. It's just that some uh, identify them as the same and others see it as similar, but a different sermon. Now we read, Luke tells us that his disciples had gathered there, as well as a large crowd of people from Judea and Jerusalem, from Tyre and Sidon. And they had come to hear Jesus teach, to be healed of their diseases, and freed from demonic oppression, and everyone was trying to touch him because power was coming out from him, and they were all being healed. Again, why was this healing taking place? Why these acts of mercy? Why these acts of power? Because Jesus was demonstrating to them exactly who he was. He is the Messiah. He was doing things the Messiah would do. This is how he proved it. Remember when John the Baptist sent his disciples to, to Jesus. Are you the expected one? Or should we look for someone else? You go tell John what you see and what you hear. And then he lists all the things that he did because this is what Messiah would do. God was authenticating the words of his messenger, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the apostle of God, the one sent by God to declare to us the word of God. And he did it through these miracles. But as now he has their attention, which is what, again, miracles are meant to do, it's powerful acts above nature, beyond nature, to stop traffic, to instill fear so that we focus on what it is that he has to say. Jesus then turns to his disciples and he begins to teach them because that's what the sermon is actually meant for, those who are going to listen to Jesus and that's what disciples are, those who listen to the word of the master and do what he says, okay? And, of course, as disciples, we're disciples of the Lord. If we're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, they're, they're, everyone who is saved is a disciple. I know that a dichotomy has been built in, in some camps. Um, you can be saved and not be a disciple, but really, if you're not a disciple, then you're, you're really not converted. We all have to take Jesus uh, at the qualifications that he has set for us, we need to be willing to take up our cross and take his yoke upon us and learn from him if we are to receive his life. And, of course, he gives us the grace to do that when he gives us his Holy Spirit. And we really won't do otherwise. We, we can't do otherwise because that's where our heart is at. Now, this morning, what I'd like us to do is consider uh, the first part of this Sermon on the Plain. We'll call it Sermon on the Plain where Jesus tells us that only those who put the kingdom of heaven first are going to enter into the kingdom and receive the benefits of the kingdom in, in this life and the life to come. In other words, it's only those who um, have these characteristics that Jesus pronounces the blessing upon that are going to receive you know, the, 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 uh, the blessing that he's talking about. Uh, one thing we always need to guard ourselves against when we read the, the Beatitudes is to see them as a list of things that we have to do in order to receive the blessing, 
right? He doesn't say, blessed are you if you do these things. He says, blessed are those who are this way, okay? If you are this way, then this blessing belongs to you, okay? That's why you're blessed, because having this characteristic or this attribute means that this blessing is yours. Now, these blessings all have to do with the kingdom of heaven, but all these attributes, these characteristics have to do with what is, well, basically it's what's true of everyone who is in the kingdom. These are those qualities the Spirit of God produces. So Jesus, first of all, pronounces blessings on those who now experience difficulties because all of these characteristics represent difficulties because they have put the kingdom of heaven first. I mean, where do these difficulties actually come from that he's talking about? It comes from following Jesus. So the blessing that we get comes from the things that we basically have to suffer because we're willing to do that, because we have the Spirit of God, because we've trusted Jesus, because we're a part of the kingdom, we're being hated by the world. That shows that we are blessed. Now, Jesus begins by saying this, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Essentially, blessed are you who are now poor, because you're not really poor, but you're actually rich. You possess the kingdom. Now, the important thing to see here is what does Jesus mean by poor? Well, he can mean several things. He can mean actually poor, you know, having very little of the world's goods. Uh, we, we read about uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Lazar, I mean, Lazarus was blessed, wasn't he? Because the kingdom belonged to him. But listen to what James writes in James chapter 2, verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? You see, it's, well, it's, it's a blessing to, in this case, be poor. Now, I don't think that, that James or Jesus are saying that they're blessed just because they're poor, because there's a lot of poor people who aren't trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, but these are blessed because in their poverty, they're looking to the Lord, okay? They're looking to Jesus alone to meet their needs. Uh, this is one of the benefits that, that comes to those who don't have very much. Uh, we're warned against actually riches in the book of Proverbs by saying, if I, you know, don't give me riches, Lord, because if I have riches, I might be tempted to forget you and uh, blaspheme your name. You know, when things are going well, do you seek the Lord? When things are going hard, do you seek the Lord? I think you find that you seek Him a lot more when things are hard. Well, that's one of the benefits of not having a lot of things to trust in. It makes you have to trust in the Lord. So it could mean that. Or he could mean poor in spirit, which is what he says in the Sermon on the Mount, which means humble. We can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless we first empty ourselves of our own righteousness and see ourselves as impoverished before the Lord, confess our sins, and trust in Jesus and his righteousness alone to save us. That, that could be what he has in mind. Or he could be referring to those who have become poor for the sake of gaining the kingdom. Uh, as our Lord Jesus tells us in one of his parables, the kingdom parables in Matthew 13, verse 44. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and, and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. By the way, when Jesus said that, he was saying that is what is true of everybody who sees the value of the kingdom of heaven is that they essentially give up all they have in order to possess that. Um, just as he says in Luke 14, verse 33, also, none of you can be my disciples who does not give up all his own possessions. Now, I think what Jesus has in mind here is really a combination perhaps of all these things. We need essentially to have done what the rich young ruler failed to do when Jesus told him, answered his question, what do I lack? Jesus said, this is what you lack. Sell all you have, give it to the poor and come and follow me. We need to do what he failed to do. We need to take our eyes off 
of our possessions, take our trust away from those things, get our eyes off of what the world has to offer us and fix our eyes upon Jesus and Him alone. Now, again, we know that people in the Bible had possessions. Jesus didn't tell everyone, liquidate all you have and give it to the poor. But he also knew that for these other people that he didn't command to do that, that those things were not an idol to them, but rather they were tools that they saw as a part of their stewardship in order to serve the Lord. Essentially what he's saying is you need to entrust all that he has given to you, to him, and use it for his glory, to serve him and to honor him. Now the Lord tells us here that if we have done this, if we have done what the rich young ruler could not do, uh, we've done it only by the power of the Holy Spirit. We haven't done it because we worked it up in ourselves, but He gave us the grace to do this, which means the kingdom of God belongs to us, okay? We may be poor now in a certain sense, but we are really rich because the kingdom belongs uh, to us. Now, He says, secondly, blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Um, we're blessed if we're hungry because of the poverty and so forth. Being rich in faith, we'd be blessed and so forth. But we're also blessed if in serving the Lord, uh, we're put into a situation where perhaps we have to go hungry. I mean, Paul talks about his own experiences in 2 Corinthians. And one of those experiences was that he was often basically uh, in, in the wilderness and didn't have what he needed, and he also gives a list of all the, all the basically the abuse that was inflicted on him. Uh, blessed are you if you are hungry now. Blessed if we are put into a situation where maybe we do have to suffer a little bit for the Lord. And we're also blessed uh, with regard to hunger if, as in the Sermon on the Mount, we're hungry in the sense that Jesus speaks of there because we are not as much like Jesus as we would like to be. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst after righteousness or who desire that uh, in yourself and in the world around you, in society. Now, Jesus says if these things are true of us, we will be satisfied. You know, it may be that Paul had to go hungry for a while and perhaps the other apostles did and there are people in the world who suffer for the sake of Christ, but he sustains them. And they are, are still here. But if he takes them out of the world, he takes them to heaven. And that's an even greater blessing where he satisfies them there. But the Lord says if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, everything that we need is going to be added to us here. And in heaven, we'll get to feast on all the blessings that the Lord has for us, not the least of which is we will finally be perfect. We won't have to hunger and thirst after righteousness anymore because we will be perfectly righteous and everyone around us will be and there will be nothing that will basically throw a wet blanket on that. No sin, nothing to disturb that perfect uh, love that is in heaven. Now Jesus says third, blessed are you who weep now for you shall laugh. Uh, what does he mean? Well, could mean again weeping over our circumstances. I don't think so, but I think what he means is weeping over our sins, because in our hungering and thirsting after being like Jesus Christ, we're not like Him. We are so far from what He is like. I just draw your attention to the Apostle Paul, remember. He was, I think in our estimation, one of the most sanctified men who ever lived, right? He was more like Jesus than I, was, than I am, and I probably ever will be until I arrive in heaven. And yet, towards the end of his life, he still calls himself the greatest of sinners. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all, even though he had been serving the Lord unstintingly throughout the majority of his life after the Lord had, had saved him. We weep over our sins because we are not more like Jesus. And we also are weeping over what this world is actually doing against God. When we see the direction the world is going, when we see the things that people are doing, it grieves us, just as it grieved Lot when he was in Sodom, the wickedness of those around him. It was a constant burden to him, Peter tells us. Well, if that's our experience, Jesus says we're blessed because we really do love what is right. We love righteousness. 
And it means one day we're going to enter into heaven and we're going to enter into the new heavens and the new earth where we are going to laugh with joy because there is no longer going to be any of this sin within ourselves or outside of us to grieve us. And then finally, Jesus says this in verses 22 and 23. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. Now, here's an interesting, here's an interesting point. You know, we should ask the question here, why is it that anyone would hate us if we live like Jesus? If we do what Jesus is calling us to do, why would they hate us? Why would they treat us like this? Why would they call us evil for living, for doing what Jesus calls us to do? I mean, why would anyone get upset with us if, if we try to save the life of an unborn child? We're trying to save life. Why would they get angry at us for that? Or why would they get angry at us for, for believing as Christians that in the public schools they ought to teach intelligent design? Creationism. I mean, that's actually what happened. And uh, the idea of evolution is really what is undermining the morality of our society. Why would they get upset with us for that? Or for our believing that physical intimacy should be reserved for marriage alone. Or for saying that marriage should be between one man and one woman only. Why should they get upset with us for standing up for anything that God says is right. Why, why do they do that? Well, it's because of what Paul says about the condition of mankind. Remember we talked about earlier, or maybe it was in the prayer. We are lights in a dark world, okay? We have been lit up morally so that we might actually see and know what is good, but we're among a group of people that aren't, and they're in darkness. Uh, Paul characterizes them with this one clause in, in Romans 3.18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Okay, they're in darkness, moral darkness and evil. And so when they see us doing something that is good, they call us evil. Call us evil because we're being intolerant, okay? But we're not being intolerant and we're not being evil. We're actually being good. We're doing good because what's going to happen to them on the day of judgment when they stand before the Lord? All these things that they, they called us you know, evil for rejecting, those are the things that they're going to be judged for and condemned for. It's an act of love to try to help them. That's what shining the light means in the darkness. But as we do that, the darkness hates the light even as it hated Jesus and tries to put it out. That's why Paul also says in 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And he wasn't talking just about those days. He's talking about throughout history. He is talking about today. And really, it is a mark that we're actually following the Lord, is that we are being treated in this way by the world. But Jesus says, if that is true of us, if we are putting the kingdom of heaven first and living as Jesus calls us to live and being treated this way, that we should not, you know, basically mourn and cower and, and grumble and complain, but we should leap for joy. Why? Well, because that's how the prophets were treated. When God sent the prophets to speak to his own people who were rebellious and they were treated in the same way. Uh, the prophets right now are being rewarded in heaven. Uh, we should leap for joy because the Lord is going to do the same thing for us that he did for them. So, yes, things will be difficult for us if we put the kingdom of heaven first and if we go the direction the Lord calls us to go, if we live the life he calls us to live, there's going to be some suffering, but there's going to be great joy. We'll suffer now, but there's going to be great rejoicing. In heaven and on earth, it's not going to be all suffering. We know that isn't the case. Uh, there's probably no greater times of blessing than when we have been persecuted for the sake of the Lord.
But now let's ask the other question, which is what Jesus addresses, and we'll do this much more briefly. What happens if we go the other direction? You know, Jesus pronounces a series of woes, and woe is just the opposite of blessing. Blessing is how happy are those who are this because you get this, right? Woe is how horrible will it be for those who are like this because this is what you're going to get. So what happens if we go the other way? Jesus turns these things around now. He says, first of all, in verse 24, but woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Uh, how horrible will it be or would it be to gain everything that the world has to offer and then have to spend eternity in hell? Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 16, verse 26, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Remember the parable we read of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man fared sumptuously day by day, living in splendor and so forth. He received his comfort in full. That's what Abraham told him. You've received your good things in life, and now this is what you're going to get, okay? And then Lazarus, well, he received these difficult things, and now he's being comforted. You see, now he gets an eternity of comfort. So which is more important? that we prosper here and suffer there, or that we suffer here and prosper there. Jonathan Edwards once said, it doesn't really matter, you know, who, who prospers in this life because this life is 70 or if due to strength 80, some people live 90 or 100, a few even go further than that. But what is that compared to eternity, right? It doesn't matter who prospers here. What matters is who prospers there in the eternal state. So we need to live here so that we might prosper there. That's the wisdom that Jesus is actually teaching us here. Now, Jesus goes on to say in verse 25, How horrible will it be, woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. How horrible to be, again, full, satisfied, everything going well here, only to have to hunger and thirst for an eternity in a place where everyone who is there will be denied, as Jesus tells us again in that parable, even a drop of water to ease their suffering. Do you think Jesus was, was just joking when he said this? Do you think he was serious? Okay, he was serious. This is real. This is a real place. We need to take what he says here seriously. He goes on to say in verse 25, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. I mean, again, how horrible he's saying would it be to, to laugh or to make light of what the Lord says is right here, to eat, drink, and be merry in this world, only to agonize in the next. Jesus tells us that at the end of the age, in Matthew 13, verses 49 through 50, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire... In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Bible tells us the vast majority of mankind is going to be in that situation. The righteous, there's only few righteous who walk on the narrow path. But the path that leads to destruction is broad. And there are many who go in that way. And then he says, lastly, in Luke 6, 26, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Jesus is saying, how horrible would it be for us to go through life avoid to, you know, basically avoiding offending anyone with the gospel, with what Jesus Christ says, with what is right and what is wrong, just to blend in so that others will like us and then in the end be destroyed with them. You see, the only way we're going to be a means of saving anyone is if we actually are different than they are. It's not by blending in and being no different. The world looks at the majority of the church today and they say, you know what, you're no different than, I, than we are. You know, what is it you guys have? The church, for the most part, has essentially embraced so much of what God hates that it's almost indistinguishable now from the world. We need to hold to the truth. We need to live the truth. It's, it's a very narrow path. They're going to call us narrow-minded. They're going to hate us. 
They're going to ostracize us. They're going to scorn us and insult us. That's what Jesus says. Now, if we're not being treated that way, it may be because we're not living that way. We're not actually stinging anyone, as it were, with the truth. And remember, the only reason why we would do that is not to, to make a scourge and to whip them with it, but it's to help them find their way out of it so that they can walk in the path of truth and live the way the Lord calls them to live. We mustn't blend in. We have to stand out. We have to be, remember as Luther said, be as Christ to our neighbor. Now let's back up just for a second in closing and ask this question. Why did Jesus say all of this? Was he trying to, again, scourge his disciples? Was he trying to scare his disciples? Well, he was certainly, I think, trying to open their eyes. Okay? Trying to open their eyes. He wanted them to know how things really are. He wanted those who basically were following him, he wants us to take a good look at ourselves, take a good look at our lives so that we can do what we need to do right now. Now, he wants us to know that if the things that he mentions here, the, the Beatitudes, the blessings, if those characteristics describe if us, okay, if, if they're true of us now, which they are, if we're trusting in Jesus, even though they're not there perfectly, they are there really, these desires are, are really there, and we have acted upon these desires, that if, if, if they're there, that means we've trusted him, and that means that these blessings also belong to us. And by the way, that's what the table reminds us of this morning. Why did Jesus give his life? Why did he die? He died so that he might give us life, and this is basically what that life looks like. So if these characteristics are in us, that means the life of Christ is in us, which means that Jesus laid down his life for us. And as we would prepare to come to the table, he certainly wants us to remember that. But it also reminds us that Jesus is at work in our lives right now through our struggles, through our sufferings, in order to prepare us for the kingdom of heaven. I mean, why, why does he allow his people to go through difficult times? I think one of the reasons is because he doesn't want our hearts to be attached to this world, but he wants them to be attached to that world. And sometimes he has to put the squeeze on us to get us to let go so that we will lift up our eyes. Again, it's usually during the difficult times that we really seek the Lord. So he is preparing us to enter into that kingdom but he also wants us to know that if these things that describe the blessed are not true of us, but the other things are actually true of us, he wants to warn us that we will, in the end, receive the curse and not the blessing. We cannot live like those who, whom the woes are pronounced upon and expect to enter the kingdom of heaven. So let me just end in saying this. If that is what you see in yourself this morning, you don't see the, the blessing or the characteristics of the blessed, but you see really exclusively the characteristics of those who are cursed. Then look to Jesus. Look to him. Ask him for his mercy to turn from your sins and to trust in him because he is the only one who can give you what you need in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said he's the door. He's the only way. There's no other way to God, the Father, except through him, you need to look to Jesus, you need to trust in Jesus, and you need to continue to do that throughout your entire life, and you need to see these characteristics actually being formed in you. If they are not there, then the Spirit of God isn't there. You still need Christ. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and let's ask the Lord to uh, apply uh, what we've heard. And let's also ask him to help us prepare to come to the table.